Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session, pioneering our understanding of the human brain. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jared Buzaki. Dr. Buzaki is the Biggs Professor of Neuroscience at the NYU School of Medicine, an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences in the US, Academy Europe, and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He is the co-recipient of the 2011 Brain Prize and among the top 1% most cited neuroscientists. He is also the author of the seminal book, Rhythms of the Brain. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Buzaki will be presenting high resolution recording and non-invasive perturbation tools for the human brain. My name is Dr. Roshan Akash and I'll be your moderator for today's session. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. We would also like to extend our thanks to the Brain Initiative Program Directors in particular, Dr. James Natt, for their efforts in organizing today's session. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type the question in the drop-down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email after the presentation. The presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. George Buzaki. Perhaps the best way to communicate with the brain is through closed loop interaction. This is a very simple idea. We need a biomarker, which is an input signal and we try to change that pattern in the brain with some effector mechanism. Here is a, an outline how can uh, be done, how this can be achieved in animals or in humans. There is an effector arm, there's an input arm that requires multiple steps. And uh, once the data are processed and we have the, the data available to trigger something, then we provide feedback to the brain. Now, the afferent arm can be a variety of different things. So is the case with the actuator arm. In our case, we decided we would like to use neurogrid as the afferent arm and transcranial electrical stimulation as the actuator arm. Neurogrid is a device which, is, which looks like a, a piece of wrapping paper. Uh, it's conformable, it's organic, uh, highly hydrophobic, so it sticks to the, the surface of the brain, and it is uh, partly C uh, based, uh, that is perfectly compatible with with uh, any tissue, and uh, the recording size. So you can see they are very small. They are brain. They are neuron sized. They are imprinted in this circuitry. So the first experiments we did was were carried out in rodents. And you can see here in the middle that both the bone and the dura was removed and the Eurogrid and its recording sites are placed directly on the surface. The recording sites are small, as I mentioned, they are neuron size and they are contacting the PR and through the PR they are contacting the, the surface layer of the cortex. With these tiny recording sites, we can record high density local field potentials, multiple unit activity, and occasionally single unit activity, as it is illustrated both from recordings in the neocortex and in the hippocampus after removal of the overlying tissue. The same kind of uh, neurogrids we used also in humans uh, during surgeries and, and when epileptic patients were implanted with electrodes. And you could see on the right side, the highlighted areas in yellow, that even with this very high density, the resolution is very powerful, uh, that spatial resolution, and new patterns can be identified. To see how these new patterns are useful for something, we went back to rodents. And on A, B, you can see a high density very large number of sites in this case is uh, anywhere from, from 180 to 256 uh, recording sites and amplifier. On D, you can, you can see how this is, the, the, this large neurogate corresponds to the Bregma lambda distance. And on E, 
it's visible that this, how disconformable electrodes are placed on the surface of the cortex. With the help of this large surface area uh, uh, neurogrid, we discovered that several parts of the neocortex have fast oscillations that are reminiscent of hippocampal ripples, so we can call them neocortical ripples. On uh, B, if we zoom in a little bit, and you can see that there are multiple uh, different highlighted areas, in violet, there are fast oscillations in the frontal areas and parietal areas. And on C, the, this, this fast ripple oscillations are mapped and are shown in red, embedded or, or surrounded by <coughs> a green area, which is the visual evoke responses. So on C, we can see the distribution of the this high-frequency ripple activity embedded on evoked responses in response to visual stimulation in green and somatosensory stimulation in blue. So th what is visible is that most of these ripples happen to be associated with areas that are associated one way or another with the limbic system. So indeed, when we compare how hippocampal activity and prefrontal activity or parietal, post posterior parietal activity is, is related to each other, we find this nice coupling at the ripple frequency band, in this case, about 140 hertz. So we wondered what is the significance of this uh, ripple-ripple coupling, and we did behavioral experiments where we trained animals to learn the hippocampus-dependent task, and what we found is that the coupling between the hippocampus and the neocortex became stronger over the course of learning. This is illustrated in B and also in D. This was done two years ago. Remarkably, in the intervening period, just as of last week, a paper appeared in Science, and which was basically the replication of these rodent experiments in humans. And what you can see here is that, that the medial temporal lobe, which is in this case represent mostly hippocampal recordings, and the, the nearby cortical areas, especially the, 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 the sound-making areas of the cortex are very nicely coupled with each other, and these investigators showed very nicely that whenever an, an item is recalled from memory, this is preceded by a coupling between hippocampal and neocortical ripples. So, so much about the afferent arm. These, are, these, these neurogrids are expandable, they are scalable, large areas of the cortex can be covered with this. Once we have identified the patterns in the human cortex in the future, we have to take that pattern and use it as a efferent arm and see how it affects, uh, how we can af affect and modify neocortical activity, subcortical activity, or any part of the brain. The choice we have for the, the actuator arm, in our case, is transcranial electrical stimulation. Now, transcranial electrical stimulation, there are a lot of hypothes hypothesized uh, different mechanisms. Some of them are shown here. But it, they go from uh, stochastic resonance, rhythm resonance, temporal bias of spikes, uh, network entrainment, or impulse patterns. I'd like to show you two of these, the M temporal bias of spikes and network entrainment, because these terms are the ones that are mostly uh, visible in many, many papers on either clinical or experimental uh, uh, use of transcranial electrical stimulation. So in the example, this is a freely moving animal equipped with the transcranial electrical stimulation electrodes. The electrodes were placed directly on the bone rather than the skin, and current is applied through these this, uh, electrodes. And what you can see is that both the intracellular trace and extracellular spikes can be entrained by this applied forced electrical fields. Um, in, in, a, in a freely behaving animal, this is the, also the case as it is shown on the bottom part of the figure. Uh, you, you can see that during the stimulation times when it is uh, the, the sinusoid is seen on the, on, on the left, the sinusoid stimulation at this low frequency is capable of entraining neurons. As well as it's capable of entraining the slow oscillation that happens during sleep. So we established in the rodent that electrical stimulation is capable of modifying electrical patterns in the brain, such as the slow oscillation. So we transferred this idea to the human use. In this case, we selected, with, in collaboration with, with our neurologist friends, uh, with, with epileptic patients with implanted 
grid electrodes. These are subular grid electrodes. Uh, you can see the, the, the patients here and the distribution of the electrodes. The idea was that if we can entrain source slow oscillations, maybe those could be used for something effective, either in epileptic patients or perhaps in the future in, in depressed patients. The first surprise was that, well, the, the first thing we have to do, of course, is to establish the readout of this uh, alleged effect of this slow oscillation. In this case, on the left, what you see is that whenever there are up and down states of slow oscillations occur during the up state, one can recognize sleep spindles in use over and over and over again. And this one single patient, you can see that the sites that are uh, being entrained where the coupling between slow oscillation and spindle oscillation occurs is very large and very large number of occurs and they are consistent from night to night. Now we would wanted to replace the natural slow oscillations by forced electrical transcranial electrical stimulation. To our surprise, none of the over a thousand sites that we used and, and at intensities that has been used or that have been applied in the great majority of, uh, of transcranial electrical stimulation papers, that is anywhere between 1 to 1 1.5 or, or 2 milliamps, was completely ineffective. So we wondered what is the difference between a rodent experiment and a human experiment. So we went back to the rodent experiment and try to establish what are the minimum criteria, if there is such a thing, that, re that are required to stimulate neurons from outside the skull. To make the long story short, on this figure you will see an intracellular recording under anesthesia and you can see that we can either activate neurons or we can silence neurons and in order to be effective either for entrainment or just just adjusting this, the, the, the timing of spikes, approximately one volt per meter voltage gradient is needed that should be applied near the neurons. So, of course, we cannot do intracellular or even extracellular recordings in large number of in any human patients at the moment. Therefore, we resorted to cadaver brains. What you will see here in this figure, there are about 400 electrodes placed in the cadaver brain and we are applying electrical uh, currents to the skulls directly or to the skin directly, just the same way how all these experiments are done in, in the various laboratories worldwide. The, the most important finding that we, uh, we had in this set of experiments is that a very large part of the current is shunted away by the skin uh, and the, the soft tissue, as well as the serial resistance of the skull. On the graph, on the bottom, you can see that about 80% or 70%, 80% of the, the, the current that is applied to the surface of the, of the, 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 the scalp is, is lost, and a very small amount gets actually into the brain. Now, we wondered how much electrical field, or how big the electrical fields are, where we apply the currents that are routinely used by many others in the field. And the answer is seen on the right side. So if you use about one milliamp, uh, then the electrical fields that are being in use is approximately 0 0.2. But remember, we need about one volt per meter. And in order to achieve that, we extrapolated that we need about five or more milliamp applied to the tra through traditional electrodes to the human brain. So that's a large amount of current that comes with a lot of uh, peripheral problems. And uh, therefore, we thought we have to modify our methods. And the way to modify our methods is reduce the amount of current that is applied through the electrodes to the scalp and try to increase the injected current into the brain. So my, my colleagues, uh, Mihai Varesh Lokos, as well as uh, Tony Berini designed a uh, novel approach, a novel solution, which we call intersectional short pulse stimulation, which is basically not one pair of electrodes, but multiple pairs of electrodes being used. They are stimulated with short pulses at a very high frequency rotation. Just to imagine how this works, you can record, you can see the the, the, the silhouette of a, of a human brain on the left and right, there are uh, multiple pairs of stimulation electrodes 
simulation electrodes shown in blue and red. And in a, in a, in a diagonal manner, one can stimulate through one pair, then next another pair, another pair, another pair, and it's done with a very high frequency change. So the, the advantage of this high frequency uh, stimulation is, of course, that when we are stimulating at microsecond range, then the artifacts that are affecting our recording system, such as EEG, is minuscule, much, much less than when we are stimulating with, with the, the direct currents. The other advantage is for the for future is that maybe through adjusting the, uh, the, the magnitude of the electrical pulses, we can direct the currents into the brain and target areas that are needed for particular diseases. Now, what is shown on this figure is the answer whether we can indeed affect neural activity in the brain. All these subjects had their eyes closed and therefore they induced or generated occipital alpha oscillations. Alpha oscillations are about one, about 10 hertz. And we wanted to see whether this, the magnitude of the alpha oscillations can be biased by electrical stimulation applied through the skull, or the, through the, the skull, through this uh, new method, the intersectional short path stimulation. And the answer is yes. But as you can see from the increasing, decreasing magnitude of the applied currents, that it requires about four milliamp in order to have any impact, any statistically significant impact on the magnitude of the alpha oscillation. So to summarize the actuator park story here, transcranial electrical stimulation is a nice and good and effective way to, to bias neural activity and even network activity inside the brain. The problem, of course, is that how do we inject enough current through the scalp without affecting or without producing a lot of side effects, such as stimulating the skin, the retina, the vestibular system, and even our taste receptors, which was most commonly uh, most common complaint by the, the the subject that they felt bitter uh, taste. So one solution, not the only one, of course, but the, our solution or our approach is using intersectional. Uh, pulse stimulation methods that allows us to reduce the currents under the electrodes uh, at one particular site or particular pairs of site, but the, the, because the currents are because the, the the pulses are rotating at a high frequency, the amount of uh, current that actually goes into the brain may be relatively higher. The goal, in at least in our, in our experience, is to have at least one millivolt per millimeter or one volt per meter voltage gradient around the neurons, it doesn't matter whether they're human neurons or rodent neurons, uh, but that's the requirement in order to bias uh, the, the spiking or the membrane potential. In order to achieve that, our recommendation is that at least 4.5 or larger or stronger the currents need to be applied to the scalp. Finally, we would like to stress that our results, of course, don't contradict the many valuable and interesting experiments that people have done with less currents, but we assume that those beneficial effects or deleterious effects were not actually achieved through affecting brain activity directly, but perhaps by stimulating peripheral nerves that are many of them in the, in the, um, in the skull. So to summarize the, um, the first and the second part, we started out a program. We are working hard on the, the neurogrids and, and uh, we would like to apply them in chronic recordings. Ultimately, we would like to get a, a biomarker for particular patterns, such as uh, intellectual spikes or uh, uh, predictors of seizures, and then apply the, affer the, the afferent arm uh, through transcranial electrical stimulation and see how seizures or the consequences of intellectual spikes could be diminished. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Buzaki, for that outstanding presentation. Please remember our speaker will follow up any questions about his presentation via email. Now I'm very excited to announce Dr. John Donahue will be our next speaker. He will present Merging Minds and Machines, Brain-Computer Interfaces to Restore Movement and Communication for People with Paralysis. We look forward to seeing you there. <laughs>